Yeah, so today we'll be talking a little bit about some IoT concepts. Uh, then we will look at the top 10 security vulnerabilities uh, from OWASP. Uh, then we will see a small challenge <coughs> for firmware hacking. And I'll give you about uh, 10 minutes to solve this challenge. Uh, we will look at some RF networks and how you can manipulate with the frequency of the different IoT devices. Uh, we will try to understand on what frequency range different IoT devices uh, operate. Uh, then we will look at the case study of uh, Bluetooth uh, device uh, and how you can buy a simple uh, $20 device uh, of Amazon and try to fiddle with the Bluetooth communication. Uh, we'll look at the JTAG, which is one of the very useful debugging interface on a lot of electronics. Then uh, software defined radio, which is one of the software implementation of hardware modules, uh, which uh, can be used uh, for uh, manipulating the frequency of some of the IoT devices. Uh, we will look at some uh, drone hacking. Uh, I'll introduce uh, drone hacking briefly. Uh, we will uh, understand some of the rules and regulations associated with this uh, IoT hacking. Uh, we cannot basically go around and uh, try mess with uh, different frequencies, uh, especially GPS signals. And finally, I'll uh, announce a few open positions. We are planning to develop some IoT hacking and uh, some purple teaming competitions uh, from uh, DevilSec uh, next year. So we will have some uh, student developer positions for the, uh, those competitions. And uh, you guys can apply for those positions. So Internet of Things is basically a network of uh, different objects, uh, different hardware resources, uh, devices that are connected to each other, like your microwave uh, exchanging data with cloud. Uh, there have been some smart mirrors uh, which tell you time. Uh, I don't know like why would someone need time on the mirror and all those kind of things. But uh, the space of the commercial devices, uh, your smartwatch, your refrigerator, with the uh, capability of these becoming smart, uh, they pose uh, various kind of uh, security risk. Uh, they can collect some data from your side, send it to the cloud. Uh, and we will try to see like what kind of security risk uh, this kind of environment uh, poses. So if we understand some basic concepts of these IoT devices, uh, we have uh, some sensors like your GPS, uh, your video cards, uh, your camera that collects the data. And we have some different frequency range depending on what kind of IoT device it is. We transmit the data to some other connected IoT devices or we try to send the data to the uh, cloud network. Trial. And uh, we have some data processing that happens uh, on the cloud side. Uh, basically, the data that you collected from different uh, devices, you can uh, yeah. So if we see hello again, uh, Matt, you can uh, mute it. Speak about someone intelligent, respected, and admired. Unfortunately, I have to talk about you. <laughs> so, uh, basically, That's when we uh, connect to these smart devices, uh, there is uh, some data processing that happens uh, on device, and basically, we can exchange data to a uh, cloud interface. Uh, we have a user interface which basically displays the data back uh, on the device. So one simple example is uh, this small uh, 
IoT uh, device that you can uh, buy from internet. Uh, basically, you can uh, create some kind of uh, communication interface on this uh, and display the data on your uh, smartphone. So uh, basically, you can uh, add some sensors to collect the temperature, humidity, and uh, send this data over to your smartphone over uh, like uh, some radio frequency or Bluetooth. But uh, as the IoT market size keeps on expanding and we are reaching to a point where it will be up to $1.6 trillion by 2025, there is also security threats uh, associated with this uh, uh, IoT environment. So one recent case is the Mirai botnet. Basically, uh, what happened was that some uh, botnet designers uh, targeted IoT devices, uh, which were hosting uh, Telnet as one of the services. And what happened was that uh, some of these devices were configured with very uh, weak uh, credentials. And uh, once they started scanning some of the endpoint devices, they were able to infect these devices with uh, some malware. So the green arrow shows that how they communicated with these uh, different devices over the internet. And they scanned for these devices and uh, basically used the default credentials to compromise these devices and made them uh, as part of their uh, bot network. And uh, basically, once they had enough uh, botnet devices, uh, what they did was they sent targeted attacks to some of the well-known websites like uh, Krebs on the uh, Krebs on Security was uh, one of the devices, uh, one of the websites that was targeted by the botnet, and uh, there was a massive attack on DIN, which was uh, one of the largest uh, domain service provider in October and basically using some uh, known security issue on the IoT device, they were able to uh, bring down a DNS provider and that led to massive loss of business. So OWASP uh, classifies top 10 IoT security threats. Uh, we have weak guessable passwords, obviously like if you are developing a device that comes uh, for three or four dollars uh, from uh, some country, you won't bother about uh, uh, making it very secure. Uh, there is network services like FTP and Telnet, you will uh, be able to easily find on these devices and in our firmware uh, hacking challenge, uh, you will be able to see that uh, some of the credentials are left in the configuration files by default. And the web APIs that are developed for these devices, like uh, they have non-conventional ports, like uh, services being hosted on uh, port 3000 or something like that. So they have web security vulnerabilities. Uh, they have uh, old firmware uh, that is uh, still lying there and it's never been upgraded once you bought a camera who, bother, uh, who bothers updating its firmware. They have uh, limited uh, privacy, like uh, they don't, uh, obviously if there are very low profit margins for these uh, off the shelf uh, IoT devices, they don't bother about uh, protecting your uh, payment card information. I think uh, if uh, somebody has uh, questions, they can uh, post them in chat so uh, I can answer those questions. There was a question that, did you make it so that only lecturer can speak? I think it would be better that way. And I can take a lot of questions at the end of the lecture or like if you have some questions in between, just uh, 
let me know and I'll keep on monitoring the chat. And basically there are uh, limited uh, mechanisms for ensuring that uh, the IoT device is communicating in a secured manner. They don't bother about implementing any kind of uh, TLS protection. And uh, we will also see that some of the Yeah, so Austin has a question that uh, are these devices insecure by default or uh, actual common vulnerabilities? I think it's uh, more that by design, they are placing limited uh, con uh, concern about uh, designing them securely. So we will uh, notice that some of the interfaces which are used for debugging can actually be used by hackers to uh, read data off firmware like when the device is booting up even though you ensure that uh, the device has a system on chip uh, protection and they have this uh, trusted uh, boot mode but uh, using jtag when the device is initially booting up and it is doing all those uh, bootloader operations uh, you can just uh, use some kind of debugging port to uh, read some critical information uh, over there. So what makes it challenging to provide security for these uh, devices is that like if we uh, talk about uh, pen testing these uh, devices, we will observe that they have different architectures like if you try to analyze them from a system security perspective they can have arm mips uh, they have uh, different kind of interfaces uh, they use uh, non standard protocols like this uh, mqqt is uh, one of the message queue uh, that is present on uh, one of these devices So uh, basically that makes it kind of uh, challenging to do the security analysis of some of these devices. So first thing that we will uh, have a look at is uh, firmware, which is a collection of some of the data and uh, device operations uh, that help the loading of initial operating system. And firmware images have a lot of uh, metadata, basically you store uh, U-boot which is used for initial boot up uh, U image uh, tells you what kind of uh, device tree is present on a particular device and uh, support files that help the system boot up. So a lot of this data is unencrypted and you can use uh, some tools like uh, bin walk, uh, form walker to extract useful information uh, from the device. So this brings us to a small exercise uh, that we will do. So you can uh, go to this link that I'll uh, send out. And yes, uh, most of these tools are free except for uh, IDA, which is uh, basically a pro version. So basically, like if you have a Linux system, basic, uh, you can go to this link uh, that I posted. And what I want you to down, uh, do is uh, first download the firmware from this location. The second thing is that uh, you need to use binwalker, uh, firmwalker. So it's post, uh, posted on the chat.
Yeah, let me post it to everyone. So this is a firm walker that we have. And uh, so you need to download this firmware and you use uh, need to use firm walker and uh, bin walk. to first uh, extract the firmware. So you will download the firmware inside uh, this firm worker folder and you, uh, you will be using binwalk to extract uh, this binary. So I am manufacturer of this uh, wireless router and I am concerned that the telnet service that is present on this uh, router or within the context of this binary might be insecure so uh, can you guys tell me like uh, how exactly this is insecure or like uh, what kind of uh, telnet information you can extract by extracting this uh, binary and analyzing it uh, using firm worker so we'll take uh, five uh, maybe ten minutes to see if we can extract some useful information from this uh, and if not then i'll go and uh, go out and tell you uh, how to solve this challenge so if you have any clarification questions uh, just uh, send me in the chat So firm worker is one of the script that is uh, used for searching the extracted firmware and if there are things like uh, hidden passwords, hidden configuration files, default URLs, uh, firm worker will be able to identify that information. So we first need to use binwalk and then firm worker and as a device manufacturer I am concerned that the telnet of my uh, software might be exposed somehow.
yeah so you don't need any additional uh, software just uh, form walker and bin walk uh, should be sufficient so we'll give it uh, maybe two more minutes to see if people are and yeah after that if somebody did manage to find the solution interesting so i ran this on ubuntu 16.04 which was one of the virtual machine uh, and there it ran correctly so i did not require anything like sasquatch but uh, if there is some dependency like that try installing it So uh, let's move on and see how to solve this challenge. So basically, we use uh, FormWalker to extract the files that were present uh, within this uh, directory. And <clears throat> one of the files that was extracted using form walker was uh, this telnet file so for those uh, who were able to extract this file uh, can you open this up using your uh, vi editor and see if you are able to observe anything interesting there So you will notice that uh, within this configuration file, there is command to execute telnet and it has a username alpha networks and it has a variable image sign. And if we try to look this uh, image sign within the context of this uh, dealing binary, we will observe that this image sign has a password in plain text so and this happens with a lot of iot devices that the credentials are present in uh, plain text so the iot devices uh, operate on different frequencies and if we are planning to do some uh, reverse engineering of these IoT devices, uh, we need to identify the frequencies on which uh, they operate. So ZigBee operates on 2.4 gigahertz, uh, Z-Wave on some other frequencies. So we need hardware and software that can analyze these wide range of frequencies. So to do that, uh, we first uh, observed like the different bands of frequencies that uh, these IoT devices can operate on. So like unlicensed bands operate on uh, 3 uh, 315 megahertz. And what information we need to extract while uh, we are analyzing this frequency is uh, what is the channel width, uh, what kind of modulation is being done. Uh, modulation basically uh, means that when we are uh, sending signal over the air, uh, we need to encode it using some kind of uh, 
signal hiding uh, mechanism. Then uh, bitrate tells us the rate at which the signal is being transmitted. And uh, preamble uh, tells us uh, like a backup signal we need to make sure that our device is up and running. And there are uh, parts of information like uh, whitening. So to do that in a safe and secure manner, it is advised that we build something known as a Faraday cage. And uh, one well-known example of Faraday cage is your microwave. So if you have a large enough microwave, that basically acts as a Faraday cage. It prevents the signals from leaking. But if you do have a lot of money on your hand, you can use uh, copper foiling to basically prevent the signals from uh, leaking. So uh, Bluetooth is one of the well-known uh, communication standard. It is used in uh, different devices like uh, personal digital assistants and there have been a lot of cases of uh, jamming the Bluetooth signal or hijacking some frequency ranges that are associated with Bluetooth. Uh, man in the middle attack is quite common in uh, Bluetooth. And we will have a look at one of the case studies uh, where we can use a simple device to basically read the data from Bluetooth as well as uh, identify what this data corresponds to and try to write some data to the Bluetooth channel. So these are uh, two devices uh, that you can find on Amazon. And <clears throat> when I tried uh, working on uh, one of this uh, demo, I used a BLE sniffer, which is uh, from Nordic Semiconductors. It is a little bit cheaper. I think uh, I paid $25 for this. Ubertooth One uh, provides more capabilities. Uh, it's a little bit expensive. I think around $80 or uh, $90 and BLE sniffer works uh, better on Windows. So uh, from the software perspective, what we need is uh, some uh, software tools like uh, HCI config is a command line utility present on Linux, which tells us what uh, different uh, Bluetooth devices are operating. Similarly, HCI tool can be used for uh, scanning these Bluetooth devices. If you want to check the connectivity, you can use uh, layer to ping. And similarly, SDP tool is uh, one other uh, device, uh, one other software package that you can use when uh, playing with Bluetooth. So if we look at one of the case studies and uh, I wish that uh, we had a in-person class and I could uh, bring a smart bulb to show the demo for this. But uh, I captured some of the information from uh, the command line terminal that I use. So for hacking a smart bulb, uh, so there is uh, one bulb known as, uh, let me list it out somewhere and we have uh, so from, and you can use a BLE sniffer if you want to carry out uh, this operation by yourself at home. So Bluetooth uh, uses this uh, generic attribute profile for uh, common operations like uh, data transmission. And uh, for starting this lab, uh, basically you can first uh, check your smartphone so like it's a light changing bulb and on your smartphone you can download this uh, govi home application and it will uh, help you connect to the smart bulb via bluetooth you can change color uh, make it multicolored or something like that so one useful tool that some of you might already know about is uh, wireshark that we can uh, use for analyzing the communication So we can uh, see that this device has a MAC address of uh, 5C31 uh, something something. And when you scan for this device using uh, HCI config, you will be able to identify the device. 
So next thing that you need to do is uh, basically you need to use your BLE sniffer to sniff the traffic for the Bluetooth communication. And uh, what you will observe, uh, in fact, what I observed was that there was a master slave kind of uh, communication going on between the mobile phone and the smart light bulb. And you will see that these uh, beacons are being transmitted and this represents the layer to MAC address of the Bluetooth device that we were uh, querying. There are some other uh, pieces of information which can be valuable like uh, what is the alert message. There are different hex codes for uh, different kind of communication. So for the ATT type of communication and if we look at the manual of this uh, Nordic semiconductors, they tell us that one of the filters that you can have uh, for just identifying the communication that is going on uh, between your smart bulb and your mobile phone is to filter for this uh, 0x0004. So this basically filters out everything else but leaves the ATT type of uh, communication. So next thing that uh, I observed is that uh, you can use this GAT tool, it's uh, GATT, to interact uh, with this device. So if you use the option I, you will uh, be able to run it in the interact mode. And uh, as you analyze uh, some of the traffic in Wireshark, uh, you will be able to observe this right message. Uh, in fact, if we go to the previous uh, screen, you will see that the information for the right command and at the bottom you can see this uh, value 58010301 FFFOCE. So if you change the color of the light bulb uh, multiple times, uh, you make it red, green, blue. So you will observe some kind of uh, pattern here. So notice that this uh, value 58010301 uh, uh, up to this point, it remains uh, same and what is modified is just the last part. So E12 uh, DOO. So once you change uh, it enough times, you will be able to identify which color corresponds to what uh, right message then you can use the connect command to connect with the smart bulb. And uh, next thing is uh, to try and see if you can uh, write something on this. So this uh, Bluetooth uh, sniffer tool uh, provides you ability to write to the channel as well. So you use the care write command and you pass this uh, hex code, which was uh, kind of a required preamble for Bluetooth communication. And if you pass the values uh, that uh, you can see at the end, the FF uh, at this location corresponds to the color red. And if you move it further, it is uh, corresponding to green and at the end it is corresponding to blue. So <clears throat> I think, uh, it's a good initial uh, smart device hacking exercise that you can try at home and uh, within $50 you will be able to uh, do this kind of uh, Bluetooth smart, uh, smart bulb hacking exercise. So yeah, if you have time on your hands, uh, do try this out. And uh, there are other uh, security issues uh, that are associated with uh, Bluetooth. Uh, blue bond is one of the known attacks where attacker is able to locate the communication channel of the victim and without any kind of uh, pre-required authentication, they can do man in the middle attack uh, on the Bluetooth device. Then uh, 
Bluetooth jacking uh, is one of the documented vulnerability for uh, this uh, Bluetooth jacking vulnerability. It takes advantage of the fact that uh, there is something known as a supervision, uh, supervision timeout in uh, Bluetooth communication. So after the master and slave have not communicated with each other uh, for a period of time, there is a keep alive message uh, that is uh, sent by master to slave to ensure that it's uh, still active. And uh, basically, uh, BTLE jacking uh, kind of vulnerability takes uh, advantage of the security issue that was present in this uh, supervision timeout. And basically, it can uh, restart the countdown and basically jam the communication on the peripheral device. So next interesting uh, on-device uh, interface is uh, JTAG. So it was uh, designed initially by the device uh, manufacturers uh, by common agreement that if uh, such an interface is present on the device, uh, they will be able to do debugging and they will be able to check uh, if there are any issues on the flash memory of the device. Uh, they will be able to check uh, if the integrated circuits are functioning correctly. But uh, what they did not realize is that uh, hackers can also use JTAG for manipulating the flash memory. They can change the order of the individual pins. Uh, if there is some debugging information that is leaked uh, during the boot time, that uh, can be accessed by the malicious end, uh, hackers. And moreover, they can change the state of the device and make it uh, behave differently. So if you take uh, any kind of uh, smart device apart, you will observe something known as a JTAG interface. Some of the times it will be labeled, but uh, it might be unlabeled as well. And uh, in next slide, I'll uh, tell you why it is unlabeled at times. So the things that are important on this is uh, these uh, four pins. The test data input is used for uh, input and output. They are used for debugging input and output. There is a clock uh, which ensures that the device uh, is in sync with the system clock. And TMS is uh, basically a mode select. Uh, it tells the device that, uh, hey, be, uh, be prepared for some kind of uh, interrupt and you will be uh, debugged. So at times, if the device manufacturers are a little bit uh, concerned about the fact that uh, this JTAG can be misused, they intentionally hide the order of the JTAG pins and make it difficult for the people with malicious intent who are trying to debug. But uh, the solution for that is uh, this very useful device known as uh, JTAGulator. <clears throat> it uh, allows you to scan for the order of JTAG pins. Uh, if there are multiple pins that are present on the device, uh, JTAGulator will tell you exactly which of uh, these pins are JTAG pins. Moreover, it gives you a capability to access the code and data, modify the memory contents on the fly. So another useful device to have in your arsenal if you are uh, looking to do some uh, JTAG hijacking. The next uh, important thing is known as software defined radio. Uh, probably some of you might have heard it uh, about it. Uh, those of you who had opportunity to do the, some IoT uh, pen testing. <clears throat> so software defined radio is uh, set of communication modules that uh, basically were created in as part of a software package. Uh, in a traditional uh, hardware assessment, basically these components used to be present as part of the hardware arsenal, but with the software defined radio, 
you can do all these uh, operations like uh, intercepting the signal, converting it from analog to digital, uh, modifying the uh, channel to make sure that it is on the same channel uh, and sampling rate as your uh, computer and doing the processing of different uh, FPGAs, uh, digital signal processing and making sure that the baud rate, uh, the modulation is taken care of. So all these operations uh, you can do now in uh, software. So some devices uh, that lets you access uh, this capability uh, are listed here and if you are uh, very much interested in a uh, good starting point would be ITL SDR. It is uh, less than $25. Uh, it comes with some uh, software libraries for both Windows uh, and Linux. And each of these uh, devices, uh, like uh, this one is uh, HackRF1, it costs uh, around $300. So they have their own limitations, like uh, you will see the frequency range the hack RF1 uh, can operate on is a little bit broader. Uh, if we compare to simple RTL SDR and for Blade RF, uh, you will get a lot more capabilities. So if you are planning to get one of these uh, components, uh, one thing to look at is the mode of communication that is uh, done like uh, some of these devices might operate only as a receiver but uh, with the receiving capability like RTL SDR you will be able to analyze the signals but uh, you will not be able to send back the data so if you want to jam the signal for a particular RF communication and or if you want to test the communication on a radio frequency, you will also need the capability of uh, transmitting back that data. So I believe uh, Blade RF uh, does provide that, but uh, a good starting point will be to use RTL SDR. So with uh, the some of these advanced uh, tools, you get uh, a capability known as uh, GNU radio. So it is available with, I think, Hack RF and uh, Blade RF. So it's kind of a modular uh, design framework similar to your UML diagrams. And if you want to basically do some operations on the captured RF signal, uh, like if you want to add a random source, if you want to do this uh, phase uh, shift keying modulation, uh, convert it into a different phase or if you want to uh, change the channel model, the GNU radio lets you do all these and create kind of a modular flow, gra uh, flow graph, which basically helps you intercept the signal, basically make modifications to the signal and so on. So one uh, last thing on the agenda that I have is uh, that uh, drones are also posing a big threat in uh, IoT landscape. Uh, there was a recent news that in Colorado they had uh, unidentified uh, aerial vehicles uh, surrounding the area and that got the residents in panic. And moreover, like uh, you can mount uh, laptops on a, a small computer on top of drones and transmit it to uh, some place where you can basically do uh, surveillance and basically they pose a security risk. Some uh, countermeasures that uh, have been imposed by governments to deal with this kind of threat is uh, implementing some kind of uh, geofencing like uh, airports, uh, prisons, uh, nuclear power plants they are strictly uh, no-fly zones. Uh, but uh, in uh, residential and other commercial spaces, uh, the drones uh, do pose a big threat. 
So if we analyze the modes of communication of these UAV or, or drones, uh, they operate at around two gigahertz uh, radio frequencies. And uh, you will see that they have uh, gamepad style controllers like a uh, uh, console that you will use for uh, playing FIFA or something, some similar games. Uh, those kind of uh, controllers are used to operate these drones. So like if you look at the some cheap uh, drones like DJI Phantom and uh, some similar drones, they do have a GPS uh, chip which uh, helps it log the flight data and in case the battery is running out, uh, it returns to the base. There are onboard sensors like altimeter uh, to help it uh, maintain a certain altitude. And Wi-Fi is uh, another mode of uh, communication. At times you will observe uh, there is also Bluetooth and uh, some long range communication uh, mechanism if the data transmit is uh, supposed to be a little bit slower. So one way that uh, some uh, military establishment uh, use uh, to counter the threat of the drones is to use this uh, drone defender. It basically uh, can cause the disruption of GPS signal and it lets you take control of the drone and uh, bring it down to do analysis. Uh, basically, if you want to check what was the goal of someone who was flying drone in your uh, residential or commercial space. Uh, I don't know if it is uh, out for public use, but uh, this is one of the defense against the drones. Another uh, thing that we can do is uh, we can have some kind of uh, Linux uh, capable device uh, with this uh, antenna that can be used for analyzing the frequency of the Wi-Fi communication between this uh, drone and its uh, base station. So if it's a Wi-Fi frequency uh, similar to uh, what we see in a typical uh, wireless network, you can use uh, some kind of frequency analyzer to uh, observe what frequency the drone operates on and at times also uh, disrupt this communication. So some uh, well-known tools uh, that uh, have been used is our uh, air replay. So it lets you de-authenticate the communication between uh, the drone and its base station. So if you use a command like uh, air replay ng, you can uh, send uh, 20 de-authentication messages uh, from the MAC address of drone, uh, basically which you spoofed uh, to the MAC uh, to the controller uh, that has this uh, MAC address ending in 12. So this will de-authenticate the communication between the drone and the base station. Yeah, uh, Austin posted a link of the drone hacking video. I think it is a very useful video. And I, if it's the same video that I know of, they also talk about uh, how to do this uh, drone hacking in a controlled manner. So you cannot uh, mess around with the GPS. Uh, that is a strict no according to the FAA uh, regulations. And like uh, if you are found doing that, uh, it will be a quick uh, ticket to the jail. So there are also some uh, well-known ports that are present on uh, the <coughs> drones like uh, they sometimes leave the ports of FTP and Telnet open to do some kind of uh, debugging. And uh, those are uh, the ways uh, basically, you can look for the software vulnerabilities on the drone, like uh, this GitHub uh, repo is uh, uh, basically a software repo for uh, doing the drone browsing. 
and you can look at this uh, repo and see how you can interact with the uh, application server of a particular drone. So uh, with all this <coughs> said, uh, basically, I'll uh, need to emphasize that it's something the IoT hacking is kind of different from our typical uh, web vulnerability exploration uh, or even uh, cloud security assessments. Uh, one of the things that uh, you need to do is uh, check the guidelines on different uh, frequencies uh, you uh, operate on. Like uh, you have some uh, minimum and maximum range of uh, transmission frequencies uh, that you need to follow. And <clears throat> some uh, guidelines uh, are that you should uh, document everything and make sure that you are not violating any uh, healthcare or uh, PCI standards while uh, doing your uh, research on IoT device uh, hacking. And basically, uh, make sure that you are not uh, playing with some uh, frequency ranges that are strictly regulated by government and uh, not violating any laws. <clears throat> and uh, if you are very much interested in doing this kind of uh, research, uh, basically Faraday cages are one of the ways that you can use to ensure that uh, you are not leaking any signals uh, out of your uh, lab space. And of course, they are uh, difficult to uh, or expensive to build, but uh, it is one of the suggested mechanisms. So some uh, useful resources uh, that can help you build up a software and hardware stack uh, for doing this IoT hacking is uh, this uh, link to the IoT hacking toolkit and uh, basically exploity.rs is uh, another good website uh, that I checked out. It's uh, It tells you like how you can exploit the uh, software vulnerabilities and hardware vulnerabilities of different uh, smart watches, uh, cameras, uh, uh, and other uh, gaming consoles. Uh, so lastly, <clears throat> I would uh, like to talk about uh, some uh, uh, positions uh, that we have just opened up for uh, both undergraduate and uh, graduate students who are interested in uh, help uh, helping us uh, develop a purple teaming competition uh, for the students from uh, Naval Academy and uh, IoT competition. So we are planning to host uh, some uh, students uh, from uh, Naval Academy and we will be developing some uh, training programs for them. Uh, so DevilSec will be the in charge of uh, leading this effort. So we will have a purple teaming competition where different teams will be able to uh, basically attack each other and uh, defend their own infrastructure in a cloud environment. And we will have a IoT uh, hacking workshop where we'll uh, teach the students about how to do uh, IoT hacking in a controlled manner. So we have uh, some uh, developer positions uh, created to help uh, with building this effort. So the first position, uh, and let me post the link here. So first position requires, uh, like the top two positions require US citizenship. And the last position uh, is basically open to both undergrad and uh, grad students and does not require uh, US citizenship. So the positions will be open, I think, till 11th October. So uh, check out the description. Uh, I think I'll be the one conducting interviews. Uh, so you don't need to satisfy each and every requirement of the objectives listed there. But uh, one important thing is that you need to have some kind of prior experience with uh, cloud technologies, uh, virtualization softwares, so yeah, if you are interested, uh, do apply for these positions. It will be a lot of fun uh, developing these competitions. And with that being said, uh, I am open to uh, 
any questions? If uh, not, then uh, I'll end the meeting in a minute. And yeah, if you have any uh, questions about these positions, and uh, if you are also interested in our uh, uh, hacking club DevilSec, uh, just uh, check uh, out this link. And you can join our Discord channel. Uh, I go by the name uh, uh, Lucifer over there. And you can uh, DM me if you have any questions regarding uh, today's talk or anything regarding the job positions that I uh, described. Cool, then, yeah, have a good uh, rest of your week and weekend, and thank you for attending the talk.